So Sam's been preaching through this. We are, um, by way of context, we'll start with a little background uh, with where we're at in chapter 22, verse 1. Um, right in the middle of Passion Week, so Jesus is just a couple days before the cross here, okay? Uh, Tuesday, maybe Wednesday. I'm not, not confident on, on that, but um, Jesus has taken control of the temple courts, uh, and the Jews are very upset about that. The leaders are very, very upset about that. They, so they challenged his authority, thinking their religious clout would push him out. And we heard Sam preach about Jesus' response to their challenge with two parables um, of the two, the two sons, and they're different, you know, the, the father asks them uh, to go work in the vineyard. One says he won't, and then he w- does, and then the other says he will, and then he doesn't. And then the, the uh, second parable was the parable of the uh, wicked vineyard tenants. And so here, that brings us to where we are, the third parable. We're still... He's still responding to the to the leader's challenge to to his authority, trying to regain control of the temple. Um, and each of each of these three parables do have a common theme. They they teach something specific and, and a little different, but they're the common thread through all the parables uh, is to expose Israel's rejection of their Messiah, which was promised in the Old Testament. So in answering uh, this challenge to his authority, Jesus is up to something. He's, uh, you can see it. He's flipping the script, right? They thought that the authority was theirs and that they, it was theirs to give out. So that's why they asked Jesus, where did you get your authority? They thought, well, if we didn't give it to you, then you don't have any right to do, to do what you're doing right now. So, but they don't know they have no idea who they're messing with. Okay, I, I don't know why. I don't. They got thick skulls, you know. Jesus has been doing miracles for three years. They've seen it, um, but they still have no idea who they're messing with. You know, uh, Jesus. Jesus is the one that has power and authority by nature. It's God incarnate. It's Him who should be questioning the leaders. And essentially, in these parables, that's what he's doing. Okay? Um, He lets them know that they are being relieved of their duties. And it's a dishonorable discharge for them. They would be, this is like they're officially uh, relieved from God's plan of redemption uh, with having authority in God's plan of redemption. Okay? Before I go any further, with a little bit of context now, I'm going to pray. All right? So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you again for this morning. Thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that you would help me to just be clear in teaching your word this morning and that we would be challenged and encouraged, um, that our faith would grow as a result of looking at your words. And in Jesus' name, amen. So, continuing here, if you look at the the end of the second parable, uh, the last verse, that, that shows that they had full comprehension of what Jesus was saying. And, and this further proves their guilt. Instead of Fearing the master of the vineyard, if we go with, go back to the second uh, parable, instead of fearing the master of that vineyard, whom uh, they themselves said this master would put those miserable wretches to death for killing the master's son and servants, they feared the crowds. I think that's very ironic. That's very unwise. Instead of repenting at this parable, they doubled down on their hatred of Jesus. Why is that? Why? Because of his constant assault on their self-righteousness. He's been assaulting their self-righteousness from the very beginning. And he was a real threat. He saw him. They saw him as a real threat to their way of life, which they had grown quite comfortable with. 
Yet, chapter 22, verse 1 begins, again, Jesus spoke to them. They're trying. It, it, although there was, they were seeking to arrest him, and it says, again, they, he spoke to them. He's not afraid of their tactics. See, Jesus is the one in control. He has the reins. And he's purposely driving this wedge between himself and the leaders. You might ask, why would he do that? What is his point? Well, the reason he's doing that is because he knows that it is go time. He knows that it's time for him to present himself to the nation as their Messiah, in full view of the nation, and he's not going to hold anything back. He needs to make clear who he is as God incarnate and as the Messiah. I just want to give a, uh, another brief overview of the parable that we're going into here. Um, there's a just kind of the characters and stuff. There's a king who is throwing a big party for his son who's getting married. The son is getting married. The king represents Yahweh, God the Father, just so we're clear. The son represents Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, just so we're clear. And uh, the people who are invited to this big grand party decided not to go. And apparently because they had better things to do. And the second time they were, in, they were bidden, they were called for, uh, they killed the messengers. Those murderers represent the Jews. And rightly so, the king was enraged, so he, so he enacted swift justice and destroyed their city, which is a clear prophecy to uh, the destruction of Jerusalem uh, in 70 AD, which, by the way, uh, three of the four Gospels, including Matthew, the only John was written after 70 AD. And there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of evidence and, and history that points to that. So just so we know, Jesus is an accurate prophet. Then, uh, So then in the parable, the king invites anyone and everyone. Since those who were invited didn't come and he even murdered the messengers, he, he went out into the streets and invited everyone. Um, and then he found, when the wedding uh, hall was filled, he found one person who entered uh, falsely, disingenuously. So we had that person kicked out. We're going to look at um, some eternal truths that Jesus is uh, teaching in, in this parable. Uh, and that's, that's what Jesus does. He's, he's a master communicator. These stories, these parables are great pictures of eternal truths that he is applying in his context and at his point in time in history. Um, and the point of Almost all the parables that Jesus teaches, especially in Matthew, was to explain why the kingdom of God, which the Jews were looking forward to, uh, the nation of Israel being uh, restored to prominence and power, why the kingdom of God, Messiah coming back uh, with power, was being delayed. Why, if Jesus is the Messiah, why hasn't the kingdom been restored, which relates to the nation of Israel very much, but as we'll see, is much bigger than that, okay? Um, so why, why has the kingdom of God been delayed? Why, why was it not established at that time? And then, furthermore, with the point, spinning off of that point, um, it would result in this mystery that the Apostle Paul talks about, of the church, um, which this mystery was that the Gentiles would be grafted into the people of God. And these truths have great weight uh, and at that time, and if we will consider them, um, they would still uh, be very weighty for us. They're about eternity, life, death, heaven and hell, salvation and damnation. And those are the topics that Christ wanted to communicate. And so they're, they're, those are the topics that we want to preach about. That's what is in God's word. And 
again, that's, um, I like to be refocused and renew my energy uh, as I study to preach. So let's read this parable, 22 verse 1. And some questions for you to consider as we read. These are kind of the big ideas that I want you to consider. What, how does one enter the kingdom of God? And what is our role in the, in the parable? Okay. And again, Jesus spoke to them in parables saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son and sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. Again, he sent other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fattened calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully, and killed them. The king was angry, and he sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, the wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go, therefore, to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. And those servants went out into the roads and gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to look at the guests, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot and cast him into outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. So as we know, the king was excited to honor his son with a big party for his wedding. When the fullness of time came uh, for the celebration, um, he sends for the guests. It says in verse uh, 3, he sent his servants to call those who were invited. This wasn't just a last second invitation. Um, these people had already been bidden. Those were those who were invited had every opportunity to prepare themselves for this celebration. And not to mention, it's a pretty big deal to be invited to a party with the king, right? So these people, if it were me, I'd have been telling everybody, I'm going to the king's party. <laughs> are, you, are you coming? You know, it's a pretty big deal. I would have been bragging about it, okay? And so the closest thing I can think of to compare to is a few months ago in England, Prince Harry and Duchess Meghan had this big ordeal. If you saw that, you saw the streets lined for miles with, with fans as they just rode by on their carriage going towards the church. Those fans uh, probably would have given anything to, to get one of those few priceless invitations to that wedding. And I would like to ask, pose a question to some of those fans of the, the royal family. Yeah. Why? why? Why would you want to go? Is it because you know and love Harry and Meghan? Or is it for just an indication of status? See, the, the Jews loved being called the people of God. They loved that they were the people of God. But as Jesus is teaching here, they did not really... They did not produce the fruits of the people of God. They did not really know God, at least not many of them, okay? So God is calling a people to himself who will know him and produce, produce the fruit of his character. Um, so no doubt, Jesus' listeners would have been shocked to hear that those invited refused to come. This is not one of those things you just brush off. It was the very best, most expensive party that you could dream of. And it's with the most powerful person in your world. And the sec second most powerful person in your world, the son, right? 
Not to mention that a bidding from the king in that culture was a command. You don't say no to the king when he summons you. It's disrespectful to the king, and it's dishonoring to the son, which is a personal slight, even more so to the king. So what we have here are people who have this great privilege and obligation to attend the greatest celebration of their lives, and they refuse to go. A second time, the king sends for them. And the king, and this is so gracious for the king. He gives them grace by sending servants again um, to invite them. And, you know, after all, those invited to this party, they, were not, they weren't random. They were probably linked to the king or the son. They probably knew them. It's safe to say he probably cared for them, right? So he tells them again in detail, I've made my preparations. I'm ready for the celebration of my son. Come to the feast. But they paid no attention. They were unconcerned. They made light of this invitation. Now, this is... This is one of the, the great tragedies if we apply this spiritually, it's spiritual apathy, right? One of the great tragedies uh, in the world is apathy causes us to be lazy. It, it causes us to leave the soil of our hearts unturned, and it becomes a hardened path. The seed of the gospel can't take root on a hard path. Upon hearing the gospel, it's snatched away without having any impact. Now that is how the secular world views the gospel. That's how most people respond to the gospel. With, a, with apathy, a hard path that can't, that can't, the seed of the gospel can't take root. And it's, it's a tragedy. Okay, let's make sure, again, we're tracking with the analogy. So the servants that are calling on those who are invited represent prophets who spoke God's word to the nation throughout the Old Testament. They were a constant reminder to the people of God. Uh, they were a constant reminder to the people of God's redemptive plan and his plan through the Messiah. Okay, um, These prophets, they were pretty hardcore, most of them. They didn't pull any punches. If we saw them in our day, We'd think they were a little crazy, okay? But they're, they were speaking God's words. And a summary of the Old Testament prophets, this is just my basic summary. There's a lot more to it. But one of the, one of the summaries you could make is the Messiah is coming, pleading with the nation. The Messiah is coming. You must make your preparations. You must make, your, make changes. You must repent or, or you'll pay eternal consequences. Because the Messiah, not only is he coming in power as king to restore prominence, but he is coming to a people who are like him, who love him. So I like to think, I tend to think that the second set of prophets, uh, or sorry, servants, represent John the Baptist and Jesus himself. They can. It makes sense to me. John, uh, if you remember, from the beginning, John the Baptist and Jesus were preaching, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. From the beginning of their ministry, um, the, the kingdom of heaven is within your grasp. You can almost, you can have it. You just need to repent. Okay? Why, why is John the Baptist, and, were John the Baptist and Jesus preaching that more urgently than ever throughout all, all scripture? It's because Jesus was their Messiah, and he was ready and able to establish his kingdom. He just needed his people. There was one problem. Those who were invited didn't want to go. They didn't want to be in Christ's kingdom on his terms. They had other worries to take care of, crops to tend to, businesses to manage, money to make. Some even, uh, probably the more religious ones hated those servants, those messengers, so much that they killed them. 
just like John the Baptist and Jesus were killed. So I want to go back to those questions I told you guys to think about. This is one of the big ideas of, of this passage. You must respond to, to enter the kingdom. You must respond appropriately to God's gracious invitation. What's an appropriate response according to this parable? Verse 10, those servants went out into the roads and gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. What did, what did uh, those people do? They just came. That's the first thing of a, of a proper response to God's gracious invitation. Come. The, there's only one thing, the only thing I, that I can see differently about this second group that the servants invited was that they weren't actually formally invited like the Jews were, like the first group, but when they were invited, they actually came. So that is the first, that, that's the first part of appropriately responding. The second part of an appropriate response we see in verse 11. When the king came in to look at the guests, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. So not only is an appropriate response just to come, but it's to come on God's terms. Within this analogy, you must wear the proper attire. Just like we have social norms at weddings or uh, prom or red carpet events, it would have been even more uh, strict social cult cultural norms in that day. Now, with this guy in verse 11 or in verse 12, we sometimes we want to speak up for this poor guy, right? You know. We can think through the, the parable from his perspective. Well, he probably was poor. I mean, they just went out to the streets and invited anyone and everyone. He didn't have nice clothes. Or uh, maybe he was on the job and he just came straight from the job and didn't go home to change, something like that. We, we try to reason for this guy. Now, if that were the case, he would have said so. But what does verse 13, what does the end of verse 12 say? He was speechless. In other words, he had no excuse. He had no excuse. Apparently, somehow, he, he should have had the, the correct uh, garments to wear to that wedding. And I've heard it taught that in that culture, especially um, if it were a party thrown by a king or someone of nobility like that, that they would provide garments for the guests. Um, so that they could all be dressed appropriately. And I like that. I think it preaches really well with our theology, but I, I couldn't find conclusive, um, convincing uh, uh, sources for that, but I'm okay with it. <laughs> but the point, the point is, whether the king provides him or not, the man didn't have an excuse. He didn't have an excuse. He was speechless. One thing, now let's get into uh, the word picture of, uh, the, of a white robe and what that represents biblically. It's a, it's a common representative of righteousness and holiness. Much like priestly garments in the Old Testament, there were um, pure, unstained garments. Uh, it's a strong picture that uh, those priests had to be holy as they went into the presence of the Lord. Um, it represent holiness. So first of all, if, if all the guests are wearing appropriate garments, this represents, uh, this teaches that God's kingdom will be filled with righteousness and holiness. That'll be something that identifies God's kingdom. That's what we want to identify our church, righteousness and holiness, right? We want that, we want manifest 
righteousness and holiness to identify us, to set us apart from the world. Now, with, with just a little digging here, um, the question I would ask is, how does one clothe himself with proper righteousness, with the proper apparel? And I'm reminded of a passage in Isaiah 64 about our righteous deeds being as filthy rags before God. The psalmist who says that there is none who are righteous, no, not one. Jeremiah 17, 9 says that the heart of man is deceitful above all things and desperately sick, and there are many others. There's a whole host of passages in the Bible that describe our inability to actually um, act and be as God commands and desires. Now, I think a very vivid picture that would come to mind for Jesus' listeners was the, the vision of Zechariah in his book, in chapter 3 of his book. Um, and I'll, you don't need to turn there. I'll, I'll try to summarize. You can read it later. Uh, there's a lot of other details that are common in prophetic books. Um, but it is a courtroom setting, okay? This is the vision that Zechariah is having. It's a courtroom setting, and the nation of Israel is represented by uh, a high priest named Joshua. Joshua is on trial in the courtroom uh, before the Lord and Satan. The, adver the adversary and the accuser. He's on trial there. And it says that Joshua was clothed with he was clothed in filthy garments, but the Lord ordered his garments to be removed and replaced with pure vestments. The Lord promises that through the Messiah, in one single day, he will remove the people's guilt. Now, that day has, has come. But again, Jesus is teaching that uh, those who were bidden have rejected him. Also consider Isaiah 61.10, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. So back to that question, how does one clothe himself in proper righteousness? You can't. The point is, again, responding to this gracious invitation, you must come on God's terms, which is faith that God will save you by covering you with his righteousness. You cannot clothe yourself with righteousness. That, that is only, God is only able to do that, okay? So, uh, secondly, the point I'm trying to make is salvation is a gracious gift that can't be earned. Um, it's also a powerful gift that works. It's a gracious gift that we can't earn, but it's also powerful. And, and it works. It changes you. This parable does teach both an unearned entrance to the kingdom and the power that changes those who come to display real manifest righteousness. Now, <clears throat> I got another question from verse 11 through 13 about the man who didn't have a wedding garment. The people of God in the present day, uh, until Christ returns to establish his kingdom, will have, um, will have false converts. And uh, so that's, that's what he's teaching here. It, it, it will be a mixed multitude. Um, and how can we identify a false convert? Well, the short answer is we can't. It's one of those uncomfortable truths we don't get to know on this side of eternity. But I do want to say something about the nature of these things. According to this passage and many others, first of all, Jesus teaches that there are many well-meaning religious individuals who will end up spending eternity in 
outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. He's describing hell. Okay? It's an it's a reality that Jesus himself teaches very clearly. And this is a gut check of our sermon. We can't identify false converts because we can't see hearts. But we can describe the heart of one. Every human heart is a worshiper. We all worship something. That's part of what makes us God's image bearers is that we are worshipers. We uh, marvel at things that have intrinsic worth. That is what worship is, when we marvel at things with intrinsic worth. And the tragedy of the fall is that we ascribe worth to that which is worthless, or at least we ascribe too much worth to things that are worth less than the Almighty Creator God. So God rejects worship that comes from a proud heart. This is a false convert. This is the heart of a false convert. The person who presents to God all of his good deeds. Um, you know, Lord, Lord, did I not do all these things in your name? But what does God say? Jesus says, oh, depart from me. I never knew you. It's like, so it's like, Wearing, back to that analogy in Isaiah 64 of uh, our righteousness being like filthy rags, soiled garments. It's like wearing old sneakers and sweats running through a swamp and then coming before God saying, here I am, God. Don't I look good? And God says, not only do you look terrible, but you smell too, so just get out of here. So he doesn't accept worship from a proud heart. We must receive his garments of righteousness. Even under the pretense of worshiping God, a proud and self-righteous heart is only capable of exalting himself, not God. And the hope there is that God will join in that choir of one, if we're honest, right? That's what a proud heart wants. But he will not. He will never give his glory to another. Now, sometimes it's helpful to question our salvation. Um, that's what we're doing here. But on, on the other hand, I want to say that there is eternal security, but it's found in what Christ has done. It's found when I drop my charade of being good and pick up the righteousness of Christ through faith. But... You know, I find that it's okay to question um, where, I, where I'm at sometimes because there are so many warnings of people that look a lot like me, devout religious people, who will not enter heaven. <laughs> That's pretty scary. Okay? Now, big idea, the next big idea here is that I wanted you to think about real quickly as we wrap up. We have a role in this story. I mentioned earlier that Christ's purpose for these parables was to explain that the kingdom would not be established at that time. So one thing is certain. The marriage feast that Jesus is talking about has not yet commenced. The feast is ready, but the king's servants are still gathering all who will come. So don't think that we're already there at the wedding hall, relaxing, shooting the breeze, hanging out with Jesus, sipping on choice wine. That's not, that time's coming, but our role right now is much more glorious. And here at Red Mesa Fellowship, that's exactly what we want our church to be about. Okay? We want to gather all who will listen and tell them about Jesus and watch the wedding hall be filled, continue to be filled with Jesus' redeemed people. It's our heartbeat here at, at Red Mesa. And we would love to be a part of this process. We want it to be our culture in the way we do things. First, share the gospel with people as we get to know them. That Jesus Christ lived perfectly, died 
as our substitute to pay for our sins once and for all and rose to life declaring de victory over death. He is the way, the truth, the life. No one can know God the Father except through him. And then we want to teach them, we want to teach people how to read and understand the Bible and how it all points to Jesus. We can give you big handles on the Word of God so you're capable of feeding yourself spiritually. And not only capable of feeding yourself, but we want you to be able to, to feed others spiritually as well, to be part of this, this process of filling the wedding hall. Um, we want the home to be a place of biblical literacy, discipleship, mothers and fathers, taking a role of primary spiritual development for the children. It's very daunting, but it's the call of the disciple. And we want to walk the road with you guys. The last thing I observed from this passage is that the servants in this passage don't have an easy task. It's glorious, but it's not easy. Most of them were simply ignored when they invited the people. Now, that's the second best thing that can happen to you. That's the second best thing that can happen to you as a servant, as a messenger of the gospel invitation. The worst thing that could happen uh, is death. We see that. Now, I mentioned John the Baptist and Jesus being killed, but in the New Testament alone, there are many other saints martyred as messengers of the gospel. We got Apostle Paul responsible. Apostle Paul was responsible himself for many deaths, including Stephen, which is recorded in Acts. Um, Apostle John is thought to be the only one of the 11 that wasn't killed, but he was treated shamefully, tortured, and exiled. For those, but here's the thing there's joy. There's joy in this. For those few who get to who we get to witness be rescued from the domain of darkness and transferred to the kingdom of his beloved son for those who are baptized into Christ and clothed with the righteousness of Christ there's joy that cannot that all those trials and tribulations of being a servant cannot touch when we get to experience that when we see God's power within these chosen few and the point I'm trying to drive here is Jesus wraps up this parable with many are called, but few are chosen. The, within this parable, the Jews were the officially invited. Now the call is going out to many. And it's for those few who are chosen that we want to keep going to the street corners, the highways and the byways, and call on all people to respond to the free gift of salvation in Christ alone. And we eagerly await the commencement of the marriage supper of the Lamb, when all true worshipers of Yahweh will be gathered together to give Him praise that He is due. I want to end but just by reading Revelation 19, 6 through 8. This is all the true worshipers at the marriage supper of the Lamb praising his name. This is what we wait for. This is what we're working towards. It's glorious. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and the bride has made herself ready. It was granted to her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. Let's pray. Now, Father, Lord, thank you again for your word. Pray that um, you'd stir us up, all of us, to, uh, to give you a heart that truly wants to please you and, and worship you and and invite all those around us to uh, just make clear your gospel call 
and witness your spirit working. Lord, we, uh, we give you our hearts today and we pray that you are glorified and, and honored and pleased. And we thank you for the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus and the salvation that we have in him. In Jesus' name, amen.